Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and begin. Um, I think people will still be joining, um, but for the sake of time, we'll start. I'm Walter Proper and the Executive Director of the International Association of Public Health Logisticians. And we are doing the short webinar today on smart advocacy for supply chain management. And I know there's a lot of things out there on advocacy. Uh, this one was devoted really to supply chain management, the people who make it work and better supply chains. And part of it is we're going to talk about IPHL's adaptation of a toolkit to make it a toolkit designed to work with our country chapters. And what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be moderating a panel discussion and asking questions. So I'm going to go ahead and go now to our panelists. And I'll start with Rachel. Could you introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Walter. Um, hi, everyone. This is Rachel Simon. I'm the IEPHL Global Community Manager. So I work closely with Walter um, and the entire community. Um, and I was also um, helped develop and pilot the advocacy toolkit that we'll be discussing today. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. And then take sure. Could you introduce yourself? Thank you, Walter. Hi, everyone. My name is Tekshua Jabaya. I'm the Zimbabwe Chapter, chapter uh, Secretary. And um, I'm glad that I was one of the pilot members of this advocacy uh, training program in Zimbabwe. And we're glad to show the experience that we have so far from Zimbabwe. Thank you. Thank you, Tekshua. And Kamu, could you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Muma Zwana. I'm a chapter for IAPHL Zimbabwe. I'm excited about sharing with you the experiences we had on the Advocacy Smart Toolkit. Thank you. Thanks, Hamu. So again, um, please do use the Q&A function. Uh, if, you ask, if you want to ask questions at any time during the presentation, the panel, and we'll be sure to get to those questions at the end of the, of the panel. Okay, so it's the Q&A, not the chat. Thank you. So we can start off with what is advocacy? Again, we've all heard about it. What, it, what actually is when we talk about advocacy? What is it? What is it? So um, for us in public health and public health logisticians, it's really a tool for us to influence decision makers globally and locally a lot about what we're going to talk about today, especially at the country chapter level, and encouraging these decision makers to support and invest in efficient and effective health supply chains. And in, in essence, everyone is an advocate. What we've done is to develop a, a toolkit to take a country chapter through this so that they can begin developing the strategy. Okay. And so I'm going to ask Rachel now the next, the first question. And what is the IPHL Smart Advocacy Toolkit? Thanks, Walter. Um, so I'm gonna give a little bit more detail about our toolkit um, and what's included. Um, so to start, um, IPHL's Advocacy Toolkit is based on the SMART approach, um, which I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with. Um, but the goal is to try to determine um, what we can accomplish and what we can accomplish in the near term. Um, so we do that using specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound SMART objectives. Um, so you can see here, it really gets into that detail of making sure things have a deadline, things are measurable, um, and they can be accomplished in a relatively short amount of time. So with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, IPHL adapted um, the SMART Advocacy Guide originally created by the Advanced Family Planning Initiative. Um, so this adapted guide focuses specifically on advocacy for supply chain management um, and was developed with inputs from both advocacy and supply chain experts. Um, so as I mentioned before, it focuses on short-term achievements, so setting those SMART objectives and determining how best to achieve them. 
Um, this toolkit and training is designed specifically for IEPHL country chapters um, because IEPHL country chapters have specific knowledge of local supply chains and the local context. Um, they can be a great body for advocacy. Um, so the end goal of this toolkit and this training is for the chapter to develop an advocacy work plan um, and following the training, actually implement that work plan with the chapter. And later we'll hear a little bit how the IEPHL Zimbabwe chapter uh, did this. Um, so after the toolkit was originally developed, um, we piloted it with the IEPHL Zimbabwe chapter, which you can see here. Um, 15 members participated in the workshop and later shared those learnings with the other chapter members, um, as well as the global community by sharing on our listserv. Um, we also posted about it on our social media as well. Um, so the training did last two full days um, and it was conducted by three facilitators. Um, so following this pilot, the facilitators finalized the toolkit um, after making some adjustments and revisions based on feedback from the participants. So all of this kind of um, came up with the final toolkit, um, which includes several resources. The toolkit, the toolkit is available in both French and English. Um, so these resources include a welcome guide, which kind of explains the background, the overall goal of the toolkit and the training. It also lists specific learnings from the pilot that should be used going forward. Um, secondly, there is a landscape assessment form, which is to be completed by the chapter uh, before the actual workshop. So this lays out specifics about the local context and the environment. So the chapter um, does thinking around this before the actual workshop. Um, thirdly, there is a facilitation presentation um, so the facilitators would use this presentation, um, these slides, that agenda to actually give the workshop to the chapter. Um, number four, there is a chapter worksheet. So this training is very interactive. It's based on a lot of group work. So the chapter is constantly discussing and talking and learning during the training. So there is a worksheet that they fill out in small groups. Um, that helps feed into that final um, work plan. And lastly, we provide a sample agenda with the order of sessions, the timing of sessions, um, to make it easier for the facilitators when they're implementing this training. So thanks, Rachel. All right, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, just one last note: the IEPHL toolkit um, is not publicly available, but we do hope to continue training chapters in the future. Yes, thanks, thanks. And so we did learn a lot from having done it with our, our great Zimbabwe colleagues. And so I'm gonna to turn to one of them now, take sure, and to get your impressions of the training and, and the toolkit. Take sure. Thank you, Oda. Uh, thank you, everyone. Well, let me say uh, first um, and foremost, um, you know, the advocacy training is about with this one was the first training. And uh, I would like to say there was so much expectation from uh, members. Uh, the advocacy training provided a platform where members, you know, could um, uh, develop smart objectives. Uh, I think members, you can configure what Rachel is saying on smart. Uh, members were able to develop smart objectives. And uh, the platform also uh, provided uh, a clear definition of advocates, what really is advocates, and what is the differentiation uh, between advocates and the behavior change, uh, that is uh, activism. So it was indeed a, a green light, and um, it also even helped members uh, to identify uh, the key lead stakeholders that we, we needed to engage uh, you know, when implementing the advocacy. So I would say in a nutshell, um, the advocacy training 
was such a, a lighter moment in Zimbabwe, and um, it brought in a high expectation that uh, you know even here in Southern Africa we can send a communication and the advocacy can be done. Thank you, Ola. Um, thank you, Take Sure. Now, I would say one of the interesting things about our, our Zimbabwe chapter and the group of 15 who attended this training, they really have varied backgrounds, much more varied than most of our chapters. And so they're not all in the Ministry of Health or at a pharmacy. They really come from really different backgrounds. And so it was interesting to have them come together to look at how to advocate for supply chain and the people who make it work. Hamu is interesting too because of her background, a little different than others. And this, uh, um, is, I'm gonna ask her to talk really about what the group finally came up with, what were the objectives and, and what are the state steps you have been taking to achieve those? Hamu. Yeah, thank you, Walter. Uh, like you mentioned, yeah, we do come from various backgrounds. We have accountants, we have lawyers, we have supply chain officers who are not within the Ministry of Health, but they are all interested with IAPHL. Um, basically, we had quite a number of objectives, but we managed to nail down to two which we thought were of more paramount importance. So we noted that uh, in the country, we have around 1,700 healthcare facilities, which are the clinics and the hospitals. So we noted that with this, within these clinics and hospitals, there is no person who is there to do supply chain activities. If you go to the clinics, it's the nurse who is doing uh, the consultation, who is doing the counseling. She's also the person who is solely responsible for supply chain activities. So as a chapter, we decided that we need to advocate for the creation. For At the moment, we're just advocating for creation, not filling of the post because we know that if we combine this to the government, we say they don't have money at the moment. But what we want is the government to create 1,700 supply chain assistant posts, and these will be based at facility level. At the same note, we noted that we have about 52 supply chain officers who are being supported by a partner, but these posts are not within the ministry um, hierarchy. So we are also advocating for creation of these 52 posts, which uh, we have 52 districts in the country, so it will be one uh, for supply chain officer at district level. These people are already there, but they are not in the ministry structure. So we are advocating for creation of these posts. Then we also noted that we have 10 provinces within the country. And within these 10 provinces, we have members who are again being supported by a partner, but there are no substantive posts within the ministry structure. So we are advocating for the Minister of Health to create the posts for them. Whilst they are still being funded by the partner, the minister has to create the posts for them in case the fund, the partners leave. We need these people to continue doing the good work that they are doing. So we are advocating for creation of these 10 posts one uh, cadre per province who will be managing that uh, 52 supply chain officers at district and the district officers will be managing the supply chain assistance at facility level. Uh, then we also realized that within the ministry, uh, within the Directorate of Pharmacy Services, I think there are only two substantive posts, and there are also 10 people who are doing supply chain activities. They're doing a very good work, but these posts, again, are not there in the um, structure of the Minister of Health. These posts are funded by partners, so we are advocating that uh, the ministry creates and absorbs these people. These 10 cadres who are working at the DPS, which is the Director of Pharmacy Services. We are advocating for the ministry to create the posts and absorb the 10 cadres who are at the national level. We are speaking of, now the 10 posts are now at national level. They are working, uh, managing the 10 supply chain officers at the provincial level, as well as the 52 supply chain officers at district level. But all these cadres are not within the ministry structure. They are just partner funded uh, positions. Thank you, Walter. That's great. And so now let's talk about which you know, the slide talks about what are the what has been successful so far, what it, what the, the Zimbabwe chapter has been able to do. Is that take sure to talk about this or Hamu? It's still me, Walter. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, great. 
Yeah. Yes. So after the meeting that the training that we had with Walter and Rachel for the advocacy uh, training, we came back. We the first step that we had to do was to meet with the director of pharmacy services because we wanted the DPS to to buy in into our ad advocacy. So we tried to have a physical meeting with the DPS, which was not successful because of. Um, committing, uh, they were committed with other things, but we managed to hold a virtual meeting with the Zimbabwe DPS. And from the meeting, we noted that uh, the DPS is already advocating for the same. So for us, it's a plus, we're already moving with the DPS. And then uh, after the meeting with the DPS, we then decided the Minister of Health is also the Vice President of the country. We also wanted the buy-in from the Minister of Health. So whilst we are still trying to get uh, a, a formal meeting, one of our members managed to engage the Minister of Health through an informal meeting. He's also a member of uh, the Pharmacist Council. So during one of their meetings, they held the DPS, the, the vice president, and he managed to put across the issue. And the, uh, fortunately for us, again, the Minister of Health bought in into the idea and he's actually moving with us towards uh, our advocacy. Then after the meeting with the, v DP, with the VP, we are now uh, on the we are now planning to meet with the permanent secretary for health so that we now formally put our issue across. We have managed to engage him, but we haven't been able to sit down and talk to him. So what we have done is we have approached his office and he said they'll meet with us. So we are still waiting for a date from his office. I understand they have uh, committing, committing projects that are doing at the moment, but we are hopeful that the minister permanent secretary will be able to meet with us any day soon. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Hammer. So again, very interesting of why we're doing this with chapters, because they have the reach and you never know which of your chapter members can run into the Minister of Health and the Vice President of the country. So that's something that I, we believe that the advocacy, uh, IPHL offers a special opportunity for advocacy because of who are who the people are in our chapters. So let's go now as another follow-up question to that in terms of what challenges, because there's always challenges, and we talked about some while implementing your advocacy work plan. Take sure maybe you can answer this one. Sure. Thank, thank you, Oda. Uh, let me say... Um, you know, in every activity, uh, challenges um, are prone to happen. And being a national advocacy, indeed, uh, you can see the magnitude is big. And um, the challenges, we, we are still ex experiencing some, and some we experienced them. And in short, I would say we had the biggest challenge of scheduling meetings. Uh, you see that the stakeholders that we are targeting uh, to meet uh, stick with us with the busy schedules in their offices. Uh, talk of permanent secretary of uh, Minister of Health. Talk of the national director of pharmaceutical services. Uh, their schedules are so busy, and uh, just convening a meeting uh, with those stakeholders uh, was really a hassle. So that was one of uh, the registered challenge there. And um, uh, coming to issue of coordination of members. Um, like what my colleague has mentioned before that um, you know the advocacy team members is made up with members from different areas different provinces of the country and you see that some other members are 400 kilometers 600 plus 600 kilometers apart uh, you know from another another province and the code noting just to meet and engage and convene for the meetings was indeed a challenge um not not probably uh to forget the issue of funding uh, you see that the issue of data, connectivity, old online meetings, and so forth, um, has also been a challenge. And I can say we are still experiencing it now as a challenge. Um, quite a number of people, out of 15, probably you have a meeting with seven people, 10 people, the other five, they fail uh, because of data and the transportation um, are found. So I think in that show, Walter, for now, I would say those are the challenges that we've experienced and that we are experiencing. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Texture. So now, since there have been challenges, there seems to have been some successful meetings. So then the big question is, what is IPHL Zimbabwe's chance of success? And so this is both to you, Texture, and Hamu. I don't know which one would like to answer first. That's all right. I think I can start. Um, okay. Well, I, I would like to assure the community at large that um, uh, you know, from, from a Zimbabwean perspective, we are highly confident that um, the advocacy is going to be successful. Um, I will tell you uh, that as of today, we have a uh, huge buy-in, you know, of stakeholders who are in the controlling authority. Uh, we talk of the vice president of Zimbabwe, who, is, who also happens to be the minister of health. You know, we've managed to buy him in. He has blessed the advocacy. It's just a matter of finalization and um, uh, coming on board with the permanent secretary. Uh, but uh, the high level offices have a buy in. You know, later alone, the issue of um, uh, you see that the advocacy that we are putting forward here in Zimbabwe, uh, it's an existing gap in the Ministry of Health, uh, nationally rather. It's not something new that you are trying to tell the government to say, please do this. Uh, they are even saying, uh, we are really seeing this, we're experiencing this, and we honor your advocacy at our objective. So the objective is not a, a new formula or a, a new problem that we are trying to say, can you see this? It's there and it's existing. So we've got high chances, you know, in that regard. Uh, now that it's existing, the government is willing to close the gap. Um, we feel uh, the advocates will come uh, successful. And probably lastly, before I leave to Amu, uh, I would also like to mention that, uh, despite that despite the challenges that I've mentioned, the issue of money, uh, funding, transport, uh, dispersed places, um, I would like to confirm that we have got um, motivated members uh, within our team, uh, despite the challenges that we are facing so far. Our members are highly motivated and they want to see this advocacy um, objective that we have uh, coming to success. So in that all, I believe uh, we've got an assurance, you know, as a team uh, that we're going to make it. Thank you, Oda. Great, excellent, um, Teixeira. Hamu, did you want to add to uh, what Teixeira said? Yeah, yes, Walter, just to add on to what Teixeira has said. Like we have mentioned earlier that um, within the DPS, uh, the creation of this post is already in their strategy. So for us, it's a great stride that we are moving with the uh, strategy of the DPS. It, like what um, my colleague has just said, we are not pushing in something new. It's something that they're already working with. It's just that their voice was not maybe probably too loud for, for them to be heard. And us coming in, we are now amplifying their voice to the minister, to the peers, as well to the president, that there really is a gap within the Minister of Health and this has to be filled. And with the same notion, uh, we have Global Fund, who is also supporting, like I mentioned, the 10 people at the DPS, the 10 at the provinces, as well as the 52 in the districts, they are being supported by Global Fund. When we had a meeting with the DPS, he mentioned that uh, Global Fund is willing to support the cadres at facility level, but they can only do so if the government commits to take up after uh, Global Fund has left. So what we are now doing is um, we are just amplifying the voice of other partners who are already advocating for the same thing as well as the voice of the DPS to the minister. So we see ourselves uh, succeeding, probably not uh, on the timelines that we had, but definitely this is going to be a success. Uh, what we are now pushing is we have elections coming up and would want them to push this also as one of their probably campaign campaign ideas when they're campaigning that they would, they would create the post. It's one of the things they can put across on their campaigns. So we are really pushing and we know that um, with the voice that we have, we are able, we will be a success, definitely. Great, thank you, Hamo. So we're gonna go ahead for the sake of time, try to get some of the questions. And we have a question from uh, Madagascar about what about sustainability since the Ministry of, of Health uh, doesn't pay? Will donors be there 
uh, for a long period of time. So that's to take sure I have moved. So do you, what do you think about sustainability of this, ability to create these positions and pay for them? Yeah, so what we, like what we said, we are advocating for the ministry to create the post. Uh, there are posts that are already funded by partners and we know that it's not sustainable. So we want these posts to be created by the Ministry of Health for sustainability. The reason why we are putting across this advocacy is for sustainability of the post. Yes, we understand the government may not be able to pay as much as the partners are uh, paying, but if posts are there, there will always be people uh, willing to take up this post at any time. Currently, the posts that are there, they are filled. Most of the posts are filled in the Ministry of Health, and there are people who, are, who may be willing to take up the posts, even though they are not funded by partners. Okay. Rachel, did you want to add something to this uh, question? I got a note. No? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, and then there was a question whether the Zimbabwe chapter is registered in the country. Are you all registered? Um, Walter, you can answer that one. Yeah, we... let me take that. One. Oh, okay. Oh, go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll, okay. we'll let the lawyer t uh, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are in the process of registration. Uh, we have done the interviews. The registration for Zimbabwe is done with the Ministry of Social Welfare, and we have done the interviews with the Ministry of Social Welfare, and we we have been successful. Unfortunately, uh, there has been a hold. Uh, it has been made by the government that they are no longer registering um, new organizations, new non-governmental organizations, probably because of the elections that are coming up. There are organizations mm. that might register as if they want to do something, then they come in uh, with a political agenda hidden. So at the moment, uh, they are not registering any, any organizations, probably until after the elections. So we are hopeful that as soon as the lift is, the ban is lifted, we will be registered. We have done most of the groundwork. Okay, thank you. And then uh, one was more of a comment from Samuel that, um, let's see, okay. it, it, the challenge of understanding the uh, supply chain management in the Ministry of Health across African countries, especially in the lower levels of echelons, it would really be a plus if the Zimbabwe team would make a breakthrough and it would be something that we could replicate across the continent. So just basically saying important, you're doing important work and if you're successful with your advocacy and actually getting the ministry to actually post a position even without filling it now, but as a position, as a supply chain person, each facility that would be uh, going a long way. Um, Sarah uh, has asked about the toolkit. Again, the toolkit is designed for chapters and to be trained in person. Um, so we're not really sharing um, the supply chain toolkit yet because of the design is it has, I think it really needs facilitators to take people through. We're not at this point sending it to a group and saying, go through it. Um, but we, I think that can still be under discussion. But right now, based upon piloting it, we felt like we, we actually need to have trained facilitators to walk the group through to get at the smart advocacy and to really figure that out. Um, there's a question on whether Zimbabwe has a legal framework. Um, let me see, it just moved. It's moving. Whether you have a legal framework that aims at streamlining the health supply chain, like the way they do for other professions, like accounting, legal, medics. If not, what are they doing to ensure that there are legal structures to anchor these initiatives? Um, thank you, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer currently, will have the <laughs> currently we we do <clears throat> not have a structure that represents uh supply health supply chain officers what we was what's uh 
the people who are currently involved are normally pharmacists who are already registered with the Pharmacists Council of Zimbabwe, as well as the Medicine Control Authority of Zimbabwe. So that's where they, uh, their professionalism is regulated. But in terms of supply chain for health, uh, we don't have such a structure yet, maybe informally, uh, but not really a structure that is set up with an association that is legally recognized at the moment. Thank you. And Nabila from Mali um, is thankful for sharing the information. And again, they are starting a new chapter and they kind of want to know uh, if they can experience such a workshop. Um, and I can answer that for now. We, we are going to be asking our good friends at the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation for funding again. Uh, we currently, our grant has completed. Uh, but we do, as we said, the toolkit is now in French and in English. So our hope is that through funding from one of our funders, whether it's Bill and Melinda Gates or USAID, um, we will be able to conduct a francophone training and an anglophone training um, this year in with so would be two chapters. But and we can't do that until there is funding. Um, one is it's IPHL in Zimbabwe structured in government. Um, maybe for the sake of time, I could say IPHL is not a government entity. It, uh, IPHL is the chapters are associated with the international organization. And again, it's a community of practice and it's not uh, part of any government that way. So I can answer that. Um, let's see. And then there's something about newly graduated pharmacists to join public sector while they can do better in the private sector. Uh, another one from uh, Madagascar. I think, I don't know who wants to try to answer that question. Um, we just, I guess the question is if you get these posts, um, but I, I, I guess one answer is not, these posts aren't simply pharmacists. These are supply chain people. So some could be, with pharmaceutical background and some might not, they might be supply chain people. Is that right, um, Texture? Currently, yeah, the posts that I said, the district posts and the provincial posts as well as the post that DPS, they're all filled in by pharmacists who has some probably qual supply chain qualification also. So, what can be the motivation? Um, I'm not sure there isn't much in terms of money when you join the government is a supply chain officer, but probably just it for, for your experience, it is good. Uh, there's a lot of exposure when you work for the government. So there will be plenty of opportunities, even if you save the government for a few years, there will be plenty of opportunities for you when you leave the government. And also in our country, um, if you are a qualified pharmacist, you have to save, do community service for the government for at least a year. So in a way, we do have people who are always there to, to work, to, to do the work at any given time. Okay, I think, and we're kind of running out of time, but I just, there's one question about numbers of chapters and how to... So we have approximately 26 chapters. We have a lot of new chapters who have joined in the last six months. Um, some of them are, are still quite tiny. They're not at the place where Zimbabwe is now. And again, the plan is that we would like this to go forward with the chapters. Um, and of course the chapters are gonna be sharing in Zimbabwe as we are doing now and Zimbabwe chapters expected to share with other chapter leaders what they've done and what they've decided to do so that we can expand as fast as possible. And once we know more about the funding, I think the secretariat going forward with our governing council will look at what we might be able to offer in the future. Okay, um, let's see. So there's one just about, I think, take sure you're typing an answer. Okay, I think that for the sake of time, uh, we're going to end. Does anyone have a final comment? Uh, Rachel, take sure or Hamu? 
Thank you from my end and thank you to our Zimbabwe colleagues for taking the time to speak with everyone today. Um, it was a pleasure participating in the advocacy training with them and I'm very impressed by their progress so far. So thanks, Hamu. Thanks, Tikshir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rachel. I, I just remember the one point that I thought it could be of importance when you spoke about the success of our program. I uh, mm. just remember that one of our provinces, which is a metropolitan province, recently um, uh, they advertised for posts for supply chain assistance for their clinics so we mm -hmm. are moving in the same yes they did i'm not sure if they are filled yet but they did advertise for supply chain post book it's actually a pilot what they are doing is supply chain assistant post for their metropolitan clinics excellent that's great yes. information yes. so we hope hopefully as you learn more you might share with us on the list sir Again, so finally, if you are not a member of IPHL, you can join as it shows there, it is free. We are almost 8,000 members in almost 150 countries. We have country chapters and new country chapters starting all the time. Um, so it's a great um, you know, community of practice out there and the sharing that goes on is ever helpful to our members. And so I will leave it there, um, but do join. And again, then thank you. Um, for participating and attending today.